Cascades Audubon Society. Thanks everybody so much for joining us tonight. Um, this program tonight is being simulcast on YouTube as well through our partnership with the Wacken Museum. So thank you so much for Drew, who's managing for that for us in the back. And thanks so much for everybody here who has showed up to see this program in person as well. Um, we're really excited to be offering the program in person again at the beautiful Wacken Museum. Like I said, we've had our partnership with the museum for many years. So if you haven't had a chance, please come down, check out the museum, check out what new exhibits um, they have going on right now. And please come see the um, John Edson Hall of Birds up. Uh, upstairs here. It's a beautiful exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to see it or you just haven't had a chance to see it in a while, please go ahead and uh, come sometime and check out the birds. They're really, really cool to see up close. Um, we've got a great program tonight, but first um, I wanted to introduce uh, somebody to talk about a really great uh, recent announcement. So we've had a, a really exciting development regarding the Post Point Heron Colony recently, which is something that our members have been advocating for protecting for many, many years. And so tonight we have uh, Audubon, or our chapter Audubon uh, board member and the conservation manager for the Whatcom Land Trust, Alex Jeffers, who's going to talk a little bit about um, this exciting development. So please welcome Alex. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, so as Jamie was mentioning, you know, there's been a lot of work for a long time around the Post Point Heron Colony, and North Cascades Audubon members have been a key part of that. So just recently, the city did announce that they are going to be purchasing the uh, 1.75 acres around the Heron Colony to act as a buffer for the Heron Colony, which is actively expanding. So it's a huge win for North Cascades Audubon, for the Herons here in town, and for Bellingham um, sort of as a whole. So Whatcom Land Trust did help facilitate that purchase and agreed to uh, contribute $100,000 towards that purchase price so we are currently doing a public campaign to help raise that hundred thousand dollars to be able to contribute to the purchase of the heron colony so if anybody is interested uh, feel free to chat with me or you can just head straight to our website um, there if you go to the page where um, you can donate to the land trust there's a campaign option that you can make sure it goes towards that heron heron colony otherwise I'm gonna be here all night too I'm happy to answer any any questions anyone's got thanks Thanks so much. I just wanted to give a special shout out to Jamie Donaldson, who has been leading those efforts relentlessly for many, many years and done so much work um, for these herons. And uh, we just wanted to acknowledge her and all the amazing work that she's been doing. So thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, now, I, yes, thank you. Uh, now I just wanted to go through a few announcements. First, um, we do have a camp out in June happening over in Winthrop that it happens every year annually. And so signups for that are available on our website. If you go to northcascadesaudubon.org, uh, we camp out at Perigen Lake State Park and we have field trips uh, in the area. That is the first weekend in June. It's a really exciting thing that we look forward to doing. So if you're interested in that, uh, like I said, head to our website and there's details for uh, getting a reservation and signing up for that. I also just wanted to go through some of our upcoming field trips coming up in May. Uh, there's a few of them, so I'm just going to read off a few of them. Uh, there's going to be a family birding at Whatcom Falls Park on May 7th. They'll be our first Saturday of the month Semiamu Spit May 7th as well, so another choice for the same Saturday. There's also going to be uh, a continuation of the series uh, Beginning Birding by Ear at Point Whitehorn on May 16th, which there's been um, uh, one of those classes has already happened, and one is happening again uh, at the end of this month, so it hasn't happened yet. There's also a urban birding at Scudder and Pond on May 21st. And another beginning uh, bird by ear on May 22nd at White Whitehorn. And finally, the last one is a uh, birding at Larrabee State Park that's going to be happening on Saturday, May 28th. And uh, one note on that is that the Discover Pass is required uh, to park at the state park. So please uh, be aware of that. I believe it is $30 per year to get that pass so that you can park there. Uh, but the field trip, is free to go to the field trip. You can sign up for all of our events, such as field trips and other things, on our website, northcascadesaudubon.org. I did wanted to 
to mention that uh, sign up for field trips opens uh, one week prior to the field trip happening. And also, um, please be sure to check the weather about three days or so before the field trip happens. And if you're not sure about the weather and if you're going to be able to make it, go ahead and let us know so that we could open up um, spaces for other folks who for sure want to go. Um, because there are a limited number of spaces depending on the area we're going to have a field trip um, just based on capacity for what the trail or, or natural area can handle. Um, so please let us know ahead of time if you're not able to make it and we'll go ahead and open up that space for someone else. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and transition to our program. Tonight we have the Executive Director of Audubon Washington. Deborah Jensen here. We're really excited for her to speak on what's going on with State Audubon. So thank you so much, Deborah, and let's give her a big warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie, and it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you and be in this beautiful museum. Um, I'm Deborah Jensen, and as Jamie said, I'm the Executive Director for Audubon Washington. I've been in this role for two years, um, and most of that time I have been working from my home office. Sometimes I actually get to go into Seward Park Nature Center, which is where our offices are. And so today I had the distinct luxury of being here in Bellingham, meeting with many of the board members from the North Cascades Audubon, and got to go to um, Post Point Heron uh, Rookery. And so if you haven't already been there, go and please help with the campaign. And then I got to go to Scudder Pond and we were uh, lucky enough to have a pair of barred owls talking to each other and then flew over. And then after the barred owls started, stopped talking to each other, we couldn't see them anymore. Five seconds later, it started hailing really hard and we decided, I guess it's time to come back and grab a bite to eat. So it's really a pleasure to be here and um, I, it's fun to get a glimpse of what the chapter is doing up here, and you should be proud of the work of this chapter. It's really quite inspiring. Let's see if I can get this to operate. Nope, it went backwards. Sorry, Drew, you taught me, but I didn't follow it. Um, I'd like to start our program this evening by acknowledging that we're living and working on the ceded and unceded lands and the shared waters of the Coast Salish people. And I want to honor those lands and waters and thank the Coast Salish people and their leadership, past, present, and future, for their stewardship and reverence for this place. I think we understand and share a passion for the place, and we're grateful for those who came before us and what they're doing to have done and will do to make it a beautiful place in the future. So unless you've been asleep, you know that we're living in interesting times. We're more than two years into a global pandemic which is disrupting lives and our economy. And there's been a significant loss of life, human life, to this pandemic. The World Health Organization recently estimated 15 million people have died from the pandemic. We live in a nation that's polarized and civil discourse as a path to finding solutions is becoming more difficult. We're working to incorporate equity and diversity and inclusion into our communities and practices but most of us think we're still making too slow progress. There's a war in Ukraine that's causing many to have concerns about the changes in the world order. And I haven't even spoken about climate change or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recent report. So before you walk out or log off, remember, humans are a remarkably resilient species. Many of the ecosystems we're working in and care about are resilient, and when we look around, we also see signs of hope and signs of progress. All right, we're trying to get the technology to work. There we go. So this year's international theme for Earth Day is invest in our planet. There are many ways that we can invest into a cleaner and more equitable future for birds and people. We can invest our time. We can invest our compassion. We can invest our collective will to take action. We can invest our dollars into campaigns to save land. So I've titled this talk, Birds Tell Us, mostly because birds tell us it's time to act. So let me tell you the shape of our, my remarks tonight. First, I'd like to spend a little time thinking about what do birds tell us? Then I'd like to think, have us think together about what is it that's the engaging power of birds and how is that important in our individual lives and in our communities and the world? I'll provide an overview of what the uh, 
Audubon Washington is doing in our state and how we connect with the 25 chapters around the state. And I'll leave time for questions and answers. So back to this idea of birds tell us. When you hear this phrase, birds tell us, what comes to mind? Think about it. Birds tell us. Just what do birds tell us? Well, your first thought might be, wake up, it's morning. The robins out my side my house start calling well before I really want to wake up, especially at this time of year. They're singing, they're saying, wake up. Do you have birds outside your homes that are waking you up in the morning? You sleep longer in the winter, and that's not just daylight? But there's another type of wake up to birds. Think back a little bit. Do you have a specific time in your life when you first started noticing birds? Do you have a specific story or place where birds became important to you? For me, I was in third grade. I was walking home from school. That was back when we had free range children and you were allowed to walk around. And I saw a small black and white bird on the side of a tree. And I came home and I told my mom, I saw a bird that looked like a zebra. And we had a Peterson bird book in our house. So we looked it up. And I was able to find out that I had seen a black and white warbler. And I was in third grade, so I was probably eight. And I had already an interest in nature because I was already observing the things around me and noticing that there was a bird that looked like a zebra that I wasn't used to seeing. And so I was already a budding naturalist. So do you have a spark bird or a bird that was your gateway bird that got you connected to caring about birds? And do you remember a place when you were growing up or sometime later in your life where you had that experience? What was your journey? What got you to start paying attention to birds? Birds also tell us, hey, pay attention. Look around. Observe the world that you work in and live in. See what the other creatures are doing. If you live here and you've been looking around, you'll probably have noticed that the marine birds have headed north. Spring's arrived. Where I live, the osprey have only recently come back to patrol the beaches. They've had their sojourn to Baja, and now they're back for their summer vacation in Puget Sound. And they're strolling, uh, surveying, surveilling the beaches, whether it's in Puget Sound or Lake Washington, where our Seward Park Audubon Nature Center is. In a public survey that was done before COVID, 47 million people in the United States self-identified as bird watchers. And we know that during the pandemic, many people who couldn't go and do other things took up outdoor recreation and things to do outside, including taking walks and bird watching. So this number is probably a low estimate of the number of bird watchers in the United States. Bird re birds remind us to pay attention to nature and maybe learn a little bit more about these remarkable creatures with which we share the planet. We're also seeing scientific research now about how children have, are healthier when they get outside and play outside and that there are benefits to nature. We have research that says that people in hospitals recover more quickly when the view outside their window is trees and nature than when it's just concrete. So we know that there is some connection to nature that's beneficial to us. But birds also tell us that the environment is changing. You may have read about a recent study that was published that, that found that a third of the birds in this study are now nesting much earlier than they used to. It was a study of eggs from museums and over 100 years ago, when were the eggs co uh, collected compared to when eggs are around now? On average, out of these birds that they studied, 25 days earlier for nesting, birds are noticing that the climate where they live is changing. The more we learn about them, the more we'll maybe understand what's going on. There was also a study that was published in Science in 2019 that documented that nearly three billion birds, that's B, have been lost from the continental US and Canada in the last 50 years. Lots of habitat changes have caused much of this loss. And so you see the column on the right, the grassland birds, it's because we've so changed the prairie ecosystems of the United States. 
But to me, when this was published, it's a shocking figure to think about. And so I think what happens is when you have caught, a, a spark bird has caught your eye or you've started to pay attention to birds and you've gained some interest in them, then you start to read these stories and then you start to care about what's the fate of these birds. And so then you might ask the question, what can I do to help? How can I take action? There are many ways to take action. This is a group of folks doing forest restoration work in Seward Park in Seattle, where our nature center is. You might also take action by getting involved in advocacy, advocating for bills in the legislature or talking to your local or congressional leaders. And so when you think about the steps that people go through to get involved in taking action, it's often referred to as the ladder of engagement. There's awareness, there's ownership, and then there's empowerment. This idea of the ladder of engagement has been around since the late 60s amongst the social science community as a way of describing the democratic public participation process. And according to this framework, people begin at the entry level stage and during at this stage of engagement, they learn to value whatever the issues, in our case, the protection of the environment, both for its own sake and because they understand the benefits of environment to our society. And as individuals grow in their appreciation, they move through the stages of ownership and take where they know they care enough about environmental issues to understand the consequences and then finally people get empowered and want to make an effect on these issues. They want to protect the post point heron rookery. They want to make a difference for these places and these people. And so Audubon as a whole tries to inspire, support and sustain individuals as they reach these different stages of empowerment and make a difference for birds and habitat and conservation more generally. Now for me, I like things to be more simple. <laughs> so instead of all those steps in the ladder of engagement, I like to simplify it into learn, care, and act. I think we get inspired and then we learn more about the birds and as we learn more and see what's happening, we care more about what's happening and we see that what's happening with the birds is also happening to other things in our environment. And then we decide maybe I should get involved in taking some kind of action to make the world a better place. So now what I'd like to do is change and talk some about the programs and the current work of Audubon Washington. I lead the state office of the National Audubon Society. So the National Audubon Society is a 117 year old bird conservation organization. And there were many bird conservation organizations that started before Audubon. In fact, in 1898, there were state level Audubons that had been founded in 16 states. And then in, two, and in 1901, these groups of state organizations decided to work together to help create the first U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuge in Pelican Island in Florida. And then later, in 1905, the National Audubon Society was founded. And so we have always worked in collaboration with a network of local Audubon organizations. It's part of our I was going to say DNA, but that's a little dramatic, part of our way of doing business. Audubon organizes its work in flyways. And so this is our flyway map. And the important piece is that the purple dots are the chapters. And those chapters are independent Audubon organizations. The red dots are state or regional offices. The green dots are nature centers. The blue dots are um, campus chapters, and I promise you the map's not 100% current because things change. In our state, there are 25 Audubon chapters, each of which is an independent organization which has its own board, its own volunteers, its own priorities, and its own projects. And what we try to do is work collectively as a statewide network on things that we agree are shared priorities and grow the community of people who can take the opportunity to care about birds, to learn more about birds, to advance the science that we need to make good decisions, and to engage people in the local community or statewide to protect birds and the places they need now and in the future. Did you guys know that, that we had these 25 chapters? Not every single square inch of the state has a chapter, but from an organizer's perspective, the important thing is there's a chapter in every legislative district 
in, uh, in the state. So there's always somebody who's in the district of somebody who's in Olympia or in DC. So what if we wanted to talk to somebody about a policy, there might be a local Audubon person who could talk to their representative. I'm a member of your district and I'd like to talk to you about this thing. In our state program, we organize our work around four priorities, coasts, climate, working lands, and community-based conservation. And so I'll start with our work in coasts, which right now is mostly in Puget Sound. As you all know, Puget Sound is part of the Greater Salish Sea. Today happens to be day one of the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference which is run out of the Salish Sea office at, uh, at uh, I think, here, out of the, out of the Western. Um, but this year, the conference is 100% virtual. And so you could get online and see, see sessions. It's a very big scientific conference. But we're part of the Greater Salish Sea. And Puget Sound is, part, is home to hemispherically important populations of waterfowl and shorebirds and marsh birds and seabirds. And so part of the challenge of bird conservation is you need to protect multiple locations for the birds throughout their migratory life. So we need to do our work here, but there's also work that might need to get done in Canada or that might need to get done in Mexico or Ecuador. And so birds are complex to protect because they have multiple places what they call home. Now, during the European settlement of Puget Sound, nearly 80% of the tidelands and estuaries were diked or converted to agriculture. And so this resulted in untold losses of birds and salmon and other biodiversity. We've had indigenous communities living in Puget Sound for thousands of years. This region is home to more than 20 recognized tribal nations, and they still live quite close to the land. And part of why the salmon conservation issues are so important is because tribal nations still have salmon as part of their core livelihoods and their culture. Today, Puget Sound is home to four and a half million people, and significant growth is expected. Some people think we could get to six million by 2040. So Puget Sound resilience and recovery is a priority for most of us who live here and for the state. There's a complex network of agencies and organizations that work together to try to achieve recovery goals. And there is an agency called the Puget Sound Partnership that was started under Go Governor Gregoire's administration. And it has created this list of the vital signs of Puget Sound. This is the words of what constitutes health of Puget Sound. And what's interesting is that it includes healthy human populations, a vibrant human quality of life, as well as thriving species and food webs, protected and restored habitats, abundant water quality, and healthy water quantity. And so many of the other estuaries around the country have goals uh, for conservation or restoration, but most of them don't, have, don't recognize that a vibrant human quality of life is part of what we're after. Okay, it didn't change. There we go. So Audubon Washington works with the 13 chapters in the Puget Sound region. And we've been working together to think about Puget Sound bird conservation and what are the places and what are the issues. And we collaborate with scientists and other conservationists in British Columbia. Maybe, aha, there we are. Our program is organized into three pillars. First, we need um, a sound scientific foundation. Audubon always bases its work on sound scientific information. We think that we can make progress on bird conservation through science, education, advocacy, and on the ground conservation. So we start with the science, and then we identify what are key policies that we need to advocate for and make a difference on to protect the important places for birds and we work always in partnership with others to get that policy work done. And then we work on specific places that might matter for birds. I would say the chapters do the most place-based work and with the state office more often in a supporting role. Uh, 
In Puget Sound, our Director of Bird Conservation, Dr. Trina Bayard, who many of you have met, leads a team of people across Puget Sound who are creating the methods for how can we monitor and evaluate the health of avian, bird, avian populations in Puget Sound. And so this has the friendly acronym of PSEMP, the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. I promise I won't throw a lot of acronyms at you. And so over the last years, they've worked together to create standard methods and publish those methods in a lot of formal scientific journals so that we can have standard methods so that as different organizations and different agencies collect data about birds, it can get aggregated to create a baseline set of understanding. Now, a couple of years ago, the national science staff of Audubon helped us create a map, a blueprint, of what are the important places to protect birds in Puget Sound. And we incorporated a number of different kinds of information to create this map. Where are the birds, different kinds of habitat, the condition of the shoreline, the coastal resilience, what are other th benefits for these locations, what are the values of these sites for the indigenous tribes. Our goal was to identify a suite of sites that were collectively really important for bird conservation in Puget Sound. And so if you look at this map, the light colored sites are higher priority than the dark colored sites. So the hot spots are the light colored things. And if you look up at our part of the world where we are now, you can see that that whole Nooksack Lummi area and, and Birch Bay, you don't even see that it's a bay because it's this yellow, uh, yellow whitish area. And so what we've done is by identifying these places, this helps us think, what do these places need to be uh, functioning and protected and resilient for birds? And then how does that help us identify what policies we might need to work on? Or um, are there particular areas that we need to figure out how to do the restoration and conservation work? And so some of the, some of the work we're sure we need to do in the policy arena is think hard about what's happening to shorelines and shoreline armoring because all of those shore edges are important for birds. Lots of those uh, shorelines are also important gravelly beds for forage fish, which feed birds and salmon. Lots of those shorelines have important kelp and eel bed um, habitat, which are important for birds and other species. And we know that we're gonna see sea level rise from climate change in the region. So we're starting to think about sea level rise. Hmm, how do we need to deal with that? Should we be changing this community's shoreline management plans to take into account sea level rise. Similarly, we have a lot of estuaries. Remember I said that probably 80% of the tidelands and estuaries were changed since the Europeans first settled here. So what do we need to do for um, estuary conservation? Some of that is real restoration work. Some of that's go finding the funding to do the restoration work. We're all trying to think harder about how do we build climate resilience into the growth management plans of our counties. And restoration works an expensive proposition. So some of it is working on budgets to make sure there's budgets in state, county, um, local, even federal budgets. In the last couple of years, we've been able to make some real progress advancing the science getting funding in restoration pots of funding. In the last session, a bill passed with a goal of protecting 10,000 acres of kelp and eelgrass beds in the next almost 20 years. We're working on a couple of priority projects, one um, in Port Susan Bay and one in the South Sound um, to try to figure out how can we make a bigger impact with, with the chapters down there. And there's still work to be done on shoreline work and on growth management. Okay, coast was our first priority area. Now I'm switching to climate. Because of the study that I mentioned earlier, oh no, I haven't told you about that study yet. That comes next. So we're really focused on climate in part because the scientific research says that climate change is having a big impact on the ecosystems and will have a big impact or is already having an impact on birds, like the birds are nesting earlier. 
And we know that we need to reduce greenhouse gases. And to do that, we're going to need to cite clean energy and have ways that we cite it smartly. But one of the studies that the science team in National Audubon did in 2019 was they published a study called Degrees of Survival. And it looked at how many species and which species in North America were at risk of extinction, depending on how many degrees of warming the Earth experiences. And 389 is a big number. It's two-thirds of the species that are resident in North America. So it's a big deal if we get to three degrees of warming in terms of what happens to the birds. And birds are just a bellwether of what happens to other species. So the first takeaway is, this is a big deal. We don't really want to get to that degree of warming. And the second takeaway is, we still have time to make a difference, which is the same result that came out of the recent publication of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's study that came out just before Earth Day that said, there is still time to act. There are plenty of opportunities for turning the corner on, on climate change. Now, I don't know if you've already seen this study before. It's been out for a few years now. But if you care to, you can look it up. It, you know, go to climate.audubon.org, and you can type in your zip code. And it'll tell you what are the birds at risk at different degrees of warming in your zip code. Drew is saving me from the error messages. Thank you. Maybe. Thank you, sir. This is one of the advantages we have coming to Whatcom County because they have somebody who actually knows how to do this really well. Thank you, Drew. Um, and so one of the things that I did was say, what about Whatcom County? And so if you look at Whatcom County, you can see these are the results. If we get to three degrees of warming, there are 52 species in Whatcom County that are at risk of extinction. Many of them are waterfowl and shorebirds. But of course, there are also a lot of forest birds, like the red-naped red sapsucker and several other woodpeckers. So if we think about what can we do together to make an impact on climate, there are lots of individual actions you can take in your day-to-day -day life. But if we really want to get to the big picture, what we need to do is decarbonize. We need to figure out what are the energy systems that we can run our economy on that don't create greenhouse gases, that don't create carbon emissions. And so that means we need to really reduce the use of fossil fuels. We need to really increase the use of electricity to do many different things. We need to build green energy, but let's figure out smart places to site it where it's not having big adverse impacts on other things. And we need to think about what are natural solutions that can be sinks for carbon. The forests of the Pacific Northwest are really good at holding carbon. Lots of agricultural soils are really good at holding carbon. So lots of this work is about policy work. But now that we've passed lots of bills in the last couple of years in Washington state, there's also a lot of work that needs to be done on implementation. So this is just a shout out to people who came and helped get a bunch of policy bills passed in Olympia in the last couple of years. I won't go into each one of these bills unless you really want me to, but together we passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act in 2019 requiring utilities to phase out fossil fuels. We passed a Sustainable Farms and Fields Bill, which is a grant program for farmers to adopt practices so their soils sequester more carbon. We passed a clean fuel standard to reduce the carbon intensity in transportation systems, because in Washington state, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And we passed the Climate Commitment Act, which caps greenhouse gas emissions from the largest sources and uses some of that money on environmental justice issues, because some of the poorest communities and some of the communities of color have suffered the biggest impacts from pollutions. And then finally, we passed the HEAL Act in 21, which creates a coordinated approach to environmental justice across the state agencies. And one of the advantages of the Climate Commitment Act is it will generate some income that can be used to implement some of the carbon solutions. So we've gotten a lot of work done in Washington state. We're one of the leading states at state level, policies around carbon and about, uh, and about climate change. And 
Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, the West Coast has a lot of leading edge policies. But last week, President Biden was in Seattle and he signed an executive order at a ceremony in Seward Park talking about forests. And I was really lucky enough to be at that program and watch this signing. Not that watching a signing is so exciting, but it's kind of cool to get to see your president. Um, but this executive order really recognizes the importance of the world's natural capital at being part of the solutions for people and nature so that we can collectively thrive. And so part of this executive order will safeguard old growth forests, will think about how do we do a better job on wildfire management, how can we strengthen reforestation partnerships, how can we use the forests to be part of a natural solution to combat climate change, and how can we measure the natural capital of our country and take it into account in our national accounts. So it's an exciting time. Audubon has also been thinking about natural climate solutions. Lots of scientists who work in climate and work in conservation and climate have been thinking about what are the natural solutions and how do we have the natural ecosystems pay, play an important role in our solutions, both don't cut down things that don't have to get cut down and lose the carbon from them, and how can we have our forests and our agricultural ecosystems store more carbon. And the the Audubon science team has recently published a report on natural solutions. And so this report was also published in last year. And it tries to look at where are the important climate strongholds for birds? Where are birds, important strongholds for birds now that we think will also be strongholds for birds as the climate changes? And then where are there important areas for carbon storage in the country now? And where do they both occur? So where's the overlap between what's important for carbon and what's important for birds? And then where can we think about maintaining the forest or the ecosystem there now, and where do we need to protect it? And I could go on about this report for a very long time, but rather than do that, I just wanted to show you two maps to give you a sense of what this is like. So this is a map of the United States. What are the important climate strongholds for birds today? Think about where we live. And then these are two maps that show what are the important priority places for forests. And the top, the darker green color, is places that are both important for birds and important for carbon. Think about where we live. So I think you're gonna be hearing more about natural climate solutions, both from the federal agencies, our state um, commissioner of public lands, as thinking about the same kind of questions for the um, state's lands and thinking about how do we create the complete set of solutions we're going to need. Okay, I'm changing ecosystems on you. Our, our third priority area is our working lands program. And right now, most of that work is in the sage ecosystems of eastern Washington. In eastern Washington, there are eight chapters of Audubon, and we work together a Claw across this beautiful Columbia Basin landscape. This is a map of the shrub steppe ecosystems of Washington. These have also been lands that have been greatly altered or eliminated in the last 150 years, and some estimate that there's only approximately 20 or 30 percent of this historic area remaining. The eastern part of the state is also home to the ceded and unceded lands of many tribal nations, including the Yakima, the Colville, the Spokane, the Umatilla, and others. And so thinking about what happens in these lands, it, the best way to do that is work with those tribal nations with both their uh, Western and their indigenous knowledge. Almost 10 years ago, we started working, the state office started working with the eight Eastern Washington Audubon chapters and the Department of Fish and Wildlife and a couple of other partners and put together a community science program. A lot was known about the greater sage grouse and some of the large birds and a, that were huntable. And a lot was known about some of the large mammals, but very little was known about the songbirds, the smaller sage songbirds. And so we put together a community science survey to survey the songbirds of this shrub steppe habitat and figure out what were the most important places for those birds. And so we had 
a group of volunteers, over the six years, 285 people participated in this uh, community science project over six years, and they covered an area of approximately a million acres. And they put together a lot of information that was now been implemented and integrated into the state's uh, wildlife databases so that it can be used to make maps and understand where are important places for sage birds and how does that information get incorporated into the various conservation management and permitting decision making. So these eight chapters, having done the surveys, and then Trina Bayard, our uh, director of bird conservation, she's our scientist who helped make sure that they got into the right databases in state government. These eight chapters started saying, well, now we need a make it matter committee. We did all this work, we got all this bird data. How do we make it matter that this data is actually used to make a difference? And so what we've done with them is say that there's these three priority areas of work. We want to think about the restoration of those key habitats. We want to reduce the threats. Some of the threats are from land use, especially um, solar siting and wind siting right now. But some of the threats are from fire, because we're seeing an increased frequency of an intensity of fires as the climate changes. And then how do we work to have that grassroots network of the chapters uh, engage in the decision-making processes that are going on in their communities? So this is kind of how it looks in parts of eastern Washington that aren't full of sage ecosystems right now. And so think about how much clean energy we need to put in to get to our net zero carbon goals by 2045. It's a lot. We really do need to put a lot of clean energy into Washington state. Otherwise we won't get to those greenhouse gas emission goals. And if you're thinking about the birds, then you're thinking about the three degrees of extinction and more birds in trouble. But if you're thinking about rivers, you're thinking about salmon. And if you're thinking about all of us, you're thinking about heat waves and fires and human livelihoods changing. So I think most of us agree we want to get to a more sustainable uh, level of greenhouse gases. But to do that, we're going to have to put a lot of solar out there. And so one of the challenges we're facing is, where will that go? And so working with American Farmland Trust and some other partners, we got some funding through the state legislature to create a stakeholder process called, friendly name, the Least Conflict Solar Siting Process. Doesn't that just run off your tongue? You just can easily remember that? If any of you are good at branding or marketing, please help me find a better name for this. But what we're really trying to do is put a bunch of people together at a table and garner an agreement. These places would be a pretty good place for putting this clean energy. These places would be a really bad place to put the clean energy. And if you propose a lot of solar there, there's going to be a really long fight and it's going to slow you down. And these places are kind of in the middle. We're hoping if we can create that dialogue, um, then it'll be, we'll be able to get the solar put in more quickly in the low conflict places, and we'll be able to have very long discussions about the high conflict places. And so that process is just getting started. It's getting run out of uh, Washington State University's uh, energy program, because we thought that having it come out of the university would be the best home for it, and then they would be a neutral scientific party and the rest of us could participate as stakeholders. So that process is starting right now. We're hoping that it'll run through uh, the next fiscal year, like July to June, um, and then we'll have maps and hopefully some agreements. And it's an important time because the state has lots of implementation decisions that are getting made about how we're going to do the permitting to get to the level of siting that we need. So with that SAGE ecosystems together, we've made some progress on this le least conflict renewable energy. See, I really need somebody to help me with a better language. Um, we also got some funding to help with post-fire recovery because uh, on Labor Day a couple years ago, 600,000 acres burned up over Labor Day weekend. That is a scary quantity of fire. And so we really needed to get restoration on the ground right away so we didn't have invasive species like cheatgrass increasing in those ecosystems. And then we also helped get started a, a group of people who are working together, run by Fish and Wildlife, State Fish and Wildlife, to think about how do we think at the scale of the ecosystem for fire resilience? What kind of practices might we need to change? What kind of fire alerts? 
most of it's a mix of private and public land. We don't have the same kind of fire response systems in those ecosystems that we have in the forested ecosystems. So how can we make a difference on the fire resilience? And then the last bullet is the, uh, the eight chapters. They've turned their Make It Matter Committee into a conservation committee, and they are taking their data and making it matter both for individual solar sightings as well as thinking about fire resilience in their communities. The last area of our work that I'd like to talk about is community engagement and bird-friendly communities. All of us, each of us, live and work in a community, and just like your individual Audubon chapter, you're really invested in your community and you want to help people learn, care, and take action for the important birds and places in your community. Audubon Washington, our state Audubon, is headquartered in Seattle, and so that's the community-based work that we do is mostly in Seattle. A lot of this work is from our Seward Park Environmental Education Center where we offer programs to people of all ages to help foster a sense of belonging and an opportunity to learn more about the natural world and we hope join us in caring and taking action. I hope you know that people of color haven't always felt welcome in parks or in conservation organizations. And so our work in Seattle is one part of our larger EDNIB work to try to create a community that respects differences and is inclusive and welcoming. And we're based in South Seattle and it's one of the more diverse zip codes in the nation. And so working with the schools there and with the community organizations there, we're trying to be a welcoming place for people to come and learn more about our work. Oh yeah, and it's also the office for the Audubon staff, for the Audubon Washington staff. One of the things we do is take advantage of this 300-acre park that's on the shores of Lake Washington and harbors old growth forest. Most of the school children in Seattle don't get to go see old growth forest. And so by being able to come to Seward Park, they can see old growth forest, learn about it. It's truly a remarkable natural classroom for learners of all ages. And so we run our school programs here, our summer camps here, and nature walks for adults. I think this is a plant identification class. And because it's on Lake Washington, sometimes we have kids doing uh, water quality samples or learning about what are the small creatures that live in Lake Washington. And so it's a great opportunity to do lots of different kinds of STEM education. And then because it's a city park, we have a long-term partnership with the City of Seattle Parks Department to have teens part of the restoration crews. And so sometimes teens are planting things, sometimes they're removing invasive species, sometimes they're using their teen muscles to help move a log out that had, had a tree that had been taken down because it had fallen across a path. And I think that the teens really love doing something that they can come back later and see, I helped make that happen. I helped make that happen. They come back and they said to their parents, I planted those, I helped clear that out. And so they get to have that reward of having taken an action and being able to share it and show it to others. And we're hopeful in the next year, we, um, our center director, Joey Manson, has a program that we're trying to raise the money for to fund to go work in the schools, the high schools in South Seattle, to work with mostly kids of color to create a program in each high school where they would get to meet mentors who are professionals, also people of color, working in different environmental careers so they can see, wow, I didn't know you could get jobs doing that. And so give them a pathway to their futures. Now your chapter has lots of ways in which you engage the community and so do all 25 chapters of Audubon. During COVID, a lot of you have gone online or hybrid the way we are tonight to reach out to very many audiences to help people learn more about birds. We hope then care more about birds and get involved in taking action. And sometimes we're working on common things together. So I hope you know, April is Native Plant Month. Governor Inslee said it's Native Plant Month and it's Native Plant Month in lots of places. And there's a campaign across many Audubon chapters in the country to ask people to learn more about native plants and maybe plant native plants in their gardens and think about how natives can have an, a positive impact for the wildlife where you live. But there's lots of other kinds of community engagement that different chapters are doing in many different ways. And for example, some chapters are really focusing on birdability. 
How can we make places that are more accessible to people who have different physical abilities so they can get out and enjoy the birds in their areas? So I am not even going to pretend to list all the different ways that even just the 25 chapters in Washington um, create community engagement and do community-based work. But think about the work you know of the North Cascades chapter and then multiply by 25. And yes, there are differences amongst the programs, but it's really a remarkable, remarkable network. We have 50,000 Audubon members in the state of Washington, and they're engaged in different ways in the different kinds of work, some with chapters and some in other ways. This is just some of the ways Washington chapters are involved. And I should say the Lights Out program that some of the chapters are doing is because migratory birds are really impacted by the lights and they get attracted to city lights and run into glasses and glasses in your house or glasses in um, office buildings. And so there's a light at Lights Out campaign that's going on in many different chapters across the country. And then here in Washington State, we collectively work together to help pass a piece of legislation in the last session in Olympia called Outdoor Education for All. And it creates a new Office of Outdoor Education in the state's Office of uh, Public Instruction. So now outdoor education is a part of OSPI, and it puts more money into an existing program so that outdoor educators could have additional resources to work with schools to get kids outside. And then the national office, as well as our state office, runs online campaigns to get people engaged in either specific legislative actions or specific learning and outreach. And it's some of our members uh, out of the 50,000 in the state, they may read our newsletters or they may sign up for one action alert, but not be involved in any of the chapters. And so others are involved in different ways in their communities and their projects. And I think it's a wonderful example people being allowed or able to engage in any way they want to, to do what works for them. So I want to thank you for listening, listening this evening, and I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Audubon Washington's work in the coasts, in climate, in the sage lands ecosystems, and in community conservation. And I've thought a little bit about what do birds tell you? We could just make you all turn and tell the person next to you, what do birds tell you? And I'd just like to say that birds have been bringing me and a joy and connecting to nature since I was a child. And they also give me a reason to wake up and go to work every day to help make a more sustainable future for all the people and the creatures on the earth. And a lot of that work includes working with people like you. And people like you are what give me hope that we're going to be successful. Thank you. Are you going to moderate questions, Jamie, uh, Jamie, or how do you want to do it? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. And I don't, can we do questions from online, Drew, or that's not a choice? Okay. Good. We'll do that. Great, yeah. So if anyone has any questions, I will go ahead and just repeat them so that we can, folks can hear them online and uh, turn it over to answer them. Any questions? Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, um, what's the Sagebrush Committee? Is that what it's called? The Sagebrush Survey Committee? What are they moving into? What's their most important things with their uh, moving into implementation phase? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that's going on right now is that there are many solar projects already proposed in eastern Washington. And um, I think the number is. 32 projects covering 54,000 acres. I might be wrong about the number of projects, I'm not wrong about the number of acres. And so one of the things that the Clean Energy Initiative in National Audubon has done is create a GIS tool that took the data from those sage bird surveys and put it into a mapping function with other information like prime ag lands from our friends at American Farmland Trust 
and what are existing protected areas and where are the sage grouse and things like that into a mapping tool. And the chapters are, um, you know, the Kittitas County chapter might say there's a proposed solar project in our county. I'll use this mapping tool to see what it tells me about whether it's going to have an impact on the natural ecosystems in the farmlands and then participate in the permitting process. And so that's a big project because there's so many uh, individual solar siting things coming on and it's case by case engagement. And we had kind of hoped we would have gotten this systems level view done earlier, but that's not the path we're on. And so now we're doing the case by case cases and the chapters are really leading on those while we try to get that systems level point of view um, taken into account. So it's a big, that's the biggest thing that the committee is doing collectively. Thank you. Any other questions? Do I get to ask a question? So any volunteers on what's your spark bird or what's your gateway bird? Do you remember a bird that made it, that was your first bird that you thought was so cool you had to go find out what it was? Right up front. She said hers is the American Dipper. Did most of you hear what she said? Do you remember how old you were when you first thought dippers were cool? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Yesterday. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead. Turkey vulture. And what happened that caused turkey vulture to be a cool bird for you? So you would, you would still like the breakfast, even if the turkey vultures were late? You, you would still get the pancake breakfast if the turkey vultures were late? OK, good. Wouldn't want to disappoint the eight-year-old both without the breakfast and without the turkey vultures. That's a great story. Wow, I've never had a turkey vulture pancake breakfast. Hmm. Fifty years worth of that festival. That is so fun. What town in Ohio is this? Hinkley, Ohio. Hinkley, Ohio. And, and it's in the spring. <laughs> do you know that for real? That is so scary. <laughs> that is cool. Okay, we have two people who know what Buzzard Day is. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. So did anybody else come up with a question for me? Drew. Okay, so one of our online watchers says that their spark bird is a rufous-sided tohi. Can they tell us how old they were when they first saw it? Or come back to us, thank you. Good, I didn't know the online folks could chime in. That's great. Go for it. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the Lights Out program, and where is it being implemented? So the Lights Out program is a campaign run by National Audubon that different chapters are individually choosing to adopt. I know that the Seattle Audubon I live in Seattle, so I'm a member of that chapter, is very involved in it because it's in a city. And there's so many people who um, live in cities. The density is so high. And so they're trying to get individuals to both turn their lights down during spring migration, but also see if some of the businesses would turn their lights down during uh, spring migration. And 
you can imagine that doesn't go quickly. It takes a little while to get people to think about that and then act on that. And I happened to be at an event in the last week or two um, that um, Deborah Smith, who's the head of the Seattle City Light, was at. And so I asked her, is this even a thing that could happen for all those tall buildings downtown? And she said, well, interestingly enough, some of the major buildings, the lighting system is part of their heat because the light prevents, provides enough incoming therms that it actually is part of the heating and cooling system. Um, so it might be harder to implement than just flipping the switch. But she said, hmm, hmm, I haven't heard about this before. So part of it is getting people to know about it, to figure out nobody really wants their building to kill a lot of birds. You know, those migrants are flying, they see the light, they're attracted to it, they hit the glass. And so it's a, it's a campaign that's growing around the country, but I don't know enough about how widespread it is. So thanks for asking, I'll go see if I can learn a little more. Yeah, what's the question? Yeah, so the question is, with the work happening uh, in South Seattle with Audubon Washington, is there any unexpected learnings or uh, new priorities that have emerged that uh, Audubon Washington wasn't aware of previously? Would you like to ask an easy question? <laughs> so I think that the simple question, the simple answer is, it would be hard to articulate all the different things that the 25 chapters are doing that we at the state office should be learning about because it's a very diverse and engaged group of people. But I think that some of um, the examples are really um, how can communities get more people engaged in a small campaign to make a difference where they live. And then how can we amplify those when it's a project that we support conceptually, but we don't have any extra resources to go support every single project in the 25. And so one of the things that we do annually is we have an annual meeting of all of the chapters, the Audubon Council of Washington. And on the first day of that meeting, we have a gathering of chapter conservation chairs and ask chapter conservation chairs to bring their ideas to the meeting about something that's going on in their community that they think that it would be helpful if more chapters of the state got involved in. And so try to raise the bar to so to get a group of us collectively involved in things and then see what are those issues. Um, one of the issues that we're hearing about from several of the Puget Sound chapters is shoreline armoring, and creosote pilings and creosote structures in the water. The creosote because it's toxic and the shoreline armoring because it disrupts the natural shore processes and makes those shores not functioning habitat for birds and other wildlife. And so that's part of why we're starting to get into the shoreline issue and see what are the policy opportunities to get into the shoreline stuff. So I think that came more bottom up from the chapters than than not. So that's just one contemporary example. But it, it is a hard question because I think of us as a learning network. I think of the collective chapters working together as a learning network. They can share lessons with each other that might be more relevant to another chapter, but then there's always things that we could learn. And we haven't created a very formal way to do that except this one meeting annually. Cool, quail and tohi, roofside tohi. So I just think it's a fun thing to ask yourself or your colleagues, when did you first notice this? Or is there some bird that you super remember from some time? I mean, some of us, it's because we've traveled to another country and we see 
something that we've read about but never seen? Or we see something that's so different, we have to go find out what it is. Yes, ma'am. Oh, she saw, did you see a Quetzal in Mexico? Okay, so this lady has seen a Quetzal. Okay, it was in Costa Rica, not Mexico, but it was still a Quetzal. Does anybody know what a Quetzal is? Would you like to describe what a Quetzal is? Come on up. Come on. Oh, you can do this. Yes. Yes, come on. Quetzals are extraordinary birds. And um, the unusual thing, like? the unusual thing, I believe, is that it's a turquoise-colored uh, bird. That is so unusual. I mean, how tall, how long? And I, I believe it was something like that tall. And we were on a small pass through. Uh, a wooded area, a very small part, um, woods on one side in a deep ravine on the other side, and we were kind of careful not to fall over <laughs> into the depths. <laughs> and, and the other exciting thing was as we were carefully going along, along that path that I said, Wait a minute. I just I just stepped over a snake. <laughs> and, and I was trying to tell the rest of them be careful. And then the the leader was about three people ahead of me and as as we all turned to look at that animal, he said, Oh my lord, oh my lord. This is through the lens, the most poisonous snake that, that, through the lens, it's a three words for uh, dash the lens. So a lens, like a, a metal weapon, as you can imagine, that's the name of the bird. Well, it was fascinating. So one of the dangers of bird watching is your head is in the sky <laughs> and you don't want to step on fertile ants. They are dangerous vipers. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, you, I don't think you can get to get the uh, antivenom fast enough. Yeah. yeah. No, it's too far away. It's too, it's too far away. Um, so, but the Quetzale, if you ever get to see one, are spectacular birds with a very long flowing tail. And how long ago did you see this bird? How many years ago did you see the bird? So 15 years ago, and she still has this crisp picture in her mind about the bird and the snake. <laughs> Any other questions for me, to Drew? So the question is, if you give money to the National Audubon, does any money come to the state or local chapters? And the answer is yes, but not directly. And so uh, some of our budget is supported by the state office, the national office. Lots of local chapters apply and get grants from the national office to help advance individual work. And so we're one team. Yeah, we don't get any uh, direct um uh, cash, you know, per se per year, um, but we did like through grants. Uh, one example of that I just wanted to provide was um, the Harrison Reserve uh, that we've been working with the Whatcom Land Trust and other partners to raise money to build a boardwalk out in Kendall, uh, right by Kendall Elementary. We applied for and got a grant through National Audubon to support that work, uh, and so we did get funding through the National Audubon. So that's that is just one example, and and when projects come up. Um, we, uh, we do seek volunteers and things to write up those grant applications and, and try to get funding uh, from different, uh, different grants and things like that. Yeah? Yep. 
Yeah, so the question is, um, are sort of day-to-day -day operations of the North Cascades chapter, are they funded, um, they're pretty much funded through our membership and folks joining. So, uh, and when you become a member of our chapter, it's, it's a separate membership from the National North, you know, the North Cascades Audubon membership is a separate membership from the National Audubon. So when you go to our website, North, northcascadesaudubon.org, and you go to membership and join us uh, and you become a member, that money goes directly to our field trips bringing it's, yeah, it, it stays here. It goes to our, all of our uh, conservation efforts, um, putting on field trips, bringing in speakers, educational programs, all those things are, that money goes directly and stays with us. <laughs> yes. The, <laughs> yes, the, that's true. Just to repeat that, yes, it, it, it does benefit to give to both the local chapter and to the national. The money goes to different places, yeah, different programs. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate you coming. Um, I just wanted to say one, a couple more things. Um, we have some programs in the back with more information and um, bird guides, things like that. So please check out that, infor uh, that information at the table in the back. And if you're joining us online, please just go ahead and go to our website, like I've mentioned before, northcascadesaudubon.org. We have local bird guides on there about places in the county. You can, you can go birding. We have our field trips listed there and other activities going on. So please get involved. Go check out some birds. Um, and yeah. Have a great time. Thank you so much for coming out. Take care.